Katie, do you want to talk a little bit about kind of yourself and your artwork and how you kind of got into making this type of stuff? Um, yeah, so obviously I was a senior this last year when the shutdown happened. So a lot of the stuff that I was doing before that was focusing on natural dye with Professor Sen, who sort of introduced me to this world that I found really magical, I guess. Like mm. it's sort of this production of color out of things that you don't expect to produce color and, or it's like, this looks brown, but it makes pink and that, that sort of thing that I really, really loved. So it translated really well for me, like coming from school into a home environment. Like it was something that I was able to continue doing, which mm -hmm. is a good thing. Like if I had been trying to do, like another medium that I really love is oil painting. So if I had been, you know, really pursuing that heavily, I don't think I would have been able to do that. So I was lucky I didn't really have to shift gears. Um, and so a lot of the work that I was doing from March onward was thinking about this, like being at home and what that meant to me mm -hmm. in relation to this color stuff. So, um, and one of the things that was really sticking out to me was like being in the kitchen with my mom all the time and constantly mm -hmm. like cleaning up after my brothers and after my dad, and after myself. And just like this like sort of repetitiveness that I felt was really resonating with the experience of being in quarantine, like not seeing anyone, mm -hmm. like, getting back into that sort of rhythm of the quirks of my family after being away for a really long time. So it was sort of like this blending of two things I had been thinking about or was newly thinking about. Absolutely. Yeah. And kind kind of on that, on that subject, um, your title, what we talk about when we, um, talk about love was I like I was racking my brain because it sounded super familiar and then I remembered that it's from the Raymond Carver short story which yeah. is wonderful um I would just love to know a little bit more about kind of how you came up with that title what if any like connection it has to the story or if you just liked the title for how it fits with your art yeah I, I read the story a while back so I I wasn't necessarily thinking so much about like the specifics of it but mm -hmm more the, the concept of having this various love languages and things that we, we do talk about when we talk about love. And I feel like for me, and I wrote about this in association with the project, but like talking about love is not something I really like to do. And it's something that I've, I've noticed since being in quarantine that like my family doesn't really do either. Mm -hmm which is fine. It doesn't mean that feeling isn't there. It's just, we, we show it in these very specific ways and through these other things. And so I was kind of thinking about if this is me talking about love with my family, then this, this is, this would be what I would do. And this would be how I would do this and express this. And it would always be like through my hands and through stuff that I'm making. And so it's sort of thinking about talking, about love in a very different way. Yeah, that's wonderful. And also I feel, at least for me as a Williams student, something we don't necessarily do that much at Williams either. <laughs> no, no, and it's, it's a space like, even in writing about those feelings that I was having, I was sort of struggling to put it into words and feeling very like vulnerable almost saying these things that yeah. I knew were true, but I still was like, I don't know if I want to admit this about myself. Yeah but here it is, <laughs> so. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, no, that, that vulnerability is, is really hard. Um, so thanks, thanks for answering that. <laughs> um, speaking of that, so I noticed that for your, for the series, I think the spoken and the written words are really important portion of it. Like for example, you have the audio accompanying the texts that you wrote for the series. So I'm just wondering, and I think you also like mentioned, talked about your friends and families in the taxes. So I'm just wondering how do you combine those different portions together? Like the physicality of your works and the 
text and the the audio portion? How do you how do you see them together? It's a good question. Um, audio mostly came out of the fact that Professor Sen made me read aloud some of the writing that I did for the entire class. So, um, and she just in encouraged me and a couple of my fellow students encouraged me to record it and just put it with the writing bit because I, I think it just makes it a bit more personal and I think they really liked that. So. Um, I wouldn't say it was a super intentional thing on my part. Um, mm -hmm. I sort of just see it like a, another way to enter into that sort of vulnerability or my mind space. Um, but text is something that I've been thinking about a lot throughout my time at Williams associated with art. My other major is English. Mm -hmm. So it's always been a huge part of my life. And mm -hmm. I've experimented over the years with like having my writing involved in the work or if it is just a written piece and I've always felt that having some sort of narrative that is my narrative like alongside whatever I'm making is really really important so mm -hmm. I, I feel that the way that I see this work is you you look at what I've made and it's unfortunate because it's all all has to be so not physical now <laughs> but um I I would love for people to look at the pictures and like be able to see the texture and stitches and colors mm -hmm. and be able to read what is going into them and the process of making them and how that relates to my life and my experience yeah and and you you kind of touch on this in in that but um it seems like there's really like two really important parts of the art which is both the process of going through making it and the finished product itself and kind of what do you how do you kind of separate those and what do you see as their like relationship and connection with what you're trying to say with that with your art sorry i know that's a long big question <laughs> <laughs> um that is a good question i think the finished product is something that's about like more what I have done in the past and sort of like trying to make something for someone that you can give to them. Mm. And like it, it communicates a lot when you make something for someone that by hand or intentionally for them. And it's sort of imbued with this, weight or emotion or love I guess and but there's a difference between that like if it's handmade versus if you just bought it at the store and you gave it to them so like I think the process is about that and putting more into the finished product and I want like I I felt this year that I was really diving into process and what it meant to me and what it meant for those finished products because in the past I've only ever really thought about finished product and how it would look so it was very interesting for me to think about way more than usual, which I, I attribute to Professor Sen a lot. <laughs> yeah, I feel like for the work, the process is a really important part. And I'm just, I think for me, I'm most interested in like the making process for the avocados because that's such, unusual materials to use for art making. So could you just please talk a little bit, bit more about like the specific process of making it and dyeing with avocados? Yeah, um, so it's it, the parts that you don't eat, obviously. So you save the pits and the skins and you make sure that you wash them so that there's not like pieces of avocado still on them because that can make it kind of dirty and not pleasant. But um, and then you can let them dry or you can freeze them and you sort of like stockpile a couple avocados worth. Um, and then you sort of, you like simmer them, you, you put them in a pot and cover them with water and you simmer them for like 45 minutes to an hour and sort of judge it based on what color you're seeing. And then you would strain all the pits and the skins out and then you have this like clear dye and it looks sort of dark red, orange, and then you have fabric and you put it 
in the dye and then you fill with enough water so that the fabric can kind of swim around and it makes a really even dye instead. And then you get, you put it back on the stove for like half an hour to an hour. It sort of depends however much she want to do it. I'm not very scientific about any of this. <laughs> you can get very scientific, but, um, and then you let it cool in the dye. I usually leave it overnight and then you take it out. You can wash it out right away or let it dry without washing it out. And then you rinse it out. You can put it in the washer then, totally fine. So it's actually very accessible. <laughs> That's wonderful. And you mentioned that like the parts of that you use for the dye are the parts of the plant that like you don't eat. Um, and like during this COVID pandemic I think we've all become like a lot more conscious of what materials we use and how we use our resources and things like that so kind of coming home and making this in the beautiful process that you described did have did your like relationship to the um, materials that you're using change at all yeah that's interesting because when I was at school I was still doing some avocado dye and so I actually had the people at Goodrich give me avocado stuff. Oh, so I actually had way more when I was at school. But then it was sort of this thing, like if I want this, I need to make sure that my mom knows that we need avocados or like I'm not gonna go and buy five at a time because we're not gonna eat five avocados in the span of 10 days or however many days until we have to go to the store again. Because there was this sort of fear of going to the store in the beginning. And like, right. Oh, very scary and I know my my mom hated it and so it, it was sort of like a lot slower in terms of process of compiling this stuff and um and a couple of the other materials I used like onion skins were stuff that I was sort of trying to compile just based solely on the food that we were eating not like trying to outsource it in any way uh -huh. and I think it made my parents think a little bit differently about food waste, <laughs> but, um, which is a fun side effect. We started composting. So. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> I feel like we kind of touched on this a little bit, but I'm just wondering during your time as an artist at Williams and also like after you graduated, like keep producing art, keep practicing art, how do you feel like that influenced what you are doing right now? And how do you think that's part of, how do you see that as part of your life? Yeah, um, well, I actually have kept doing projects like this. Like I keep doing different dye materials and trying to dye different things and it's still sort of in the same realm of like I'm making something for someone else or maybe for myself to wear to use like to revamp a piece of clothing that I haven't worn in a long time or like give my friend a sweatshirt or something like that um so I've been I've been doing lots of projects and like now that it's been summer there have been a ton of flowers and those are a really good source for dye bats so I've been doing that and my um, aunt that actually lives out in New England is super into natural dyes and so we we text and Instagram comment at each other all the time which is fun so it's I feel like I've sort of entered into a space where it's, it's a much more sustainable art practice without having a studio which is really fun because it's given me a something to do while I've been home unexpectedly without a job <laughs> and um, it's also been a way for me to communicate with my aunt or like text my friends and say do you want anything dyed or do you want anything like can I send you something <laughs> and, um, I feel like it's but it's also made me think a lot differently about the plants that I see when I'm out walking or driving down the highway like mm. it's sort of a new lens of looking at what's around me like that could be hiding a color that I don't know about which is really really cool mm -hmm. that's wonderful so it, it sounds like 
you've really been able to have this wonderful relationship with the art and the process and having it be a way to connect with people since we all had to go home. Um, I'm also curious, before all of this happened, you were already dying things. And was there any way that kind of your time at Williams influenced your work or was an impetus to start doing this before all of this happened? Yeah. Um, well, I took a class with Professor Sen that was called Color, mm -hmm. a function or something like that. So it was all about color. And Professor Sen has been super into bringing this sort of natural environment into the art sphere. So rather than using things that are really chemically based, like make it more about cultivating an environment or a relationship with your environment. Mm -hmm. So during that class, we did a bunch of experiments with um, like making walnut ink and dyeing with indigo and using other natural dyes. And I felt really inspired by that because mostly it made me really think about the process and what was going on there. And I, I sort of fell in love with what I could put into the process and what sort of narrative I could tell through process rather than product. Mm. So um, in, the, in the fall, I like did a whole thing with natural dyes. And then I was planning on doing something probably similar, like large scale textile thing. And then that sort of scale just wasn't going to be feasible at home. So, yeah. And I think touching on the sort of emotional aspect that we were talking about earlier, um, that sense of like not talking about love at Williams. And I think that became something I thought about a lot more because of my time at Williams. Mm. Yeah. Like, there was just no space or time to consider how you feel. <laughs> 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 yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely it sounds like you you were kind of able to find this wonderful combination of having like an introspective process that then leads to a product that allows you to connect with other people which is really sounds really wonderful um what what kind of as as you move forwards i know that everything right now is so up in the air and stuff like that but um kind of as you move forwards past Williams. How do you think your time as an artist is gonna influence what you wanna do with your life and what part is art gonna play in your kind of like next steps in, in where, where you're going? Mm -hmm. if you have any idea. <laughs> Which well, is I, I actually just yesterday moved into my new job apartment. Oh, exciting. We are moving forward. <laughs> So I'm teaching English um, at Exeter for oh. the year. Um, but a lot of what I've thought about in the lead up to coming to this job is like how I can bring art into the English classroom because for me, they're so intertwined and I, I see them in each other all the time. Mm -hmm. So thinking about like projects I can do with students where they draw something or sort of engage that visual aspect, I think is one way that I'll professionally really think about it. I have no idea if I'm going to be an English teacher for the rest of my life or if I'll not like it. <laughs> um, but I've, in the past, I've been able to work with Mike Clear, who's a professor at Williams um, in his studio. And I was supposed to be doing that again this last summer. But I think because of COVID, we'll, we'll hopefully reschedule and I'll be able to still have some access to like fine art painting in my life yeah and then i'm, I'm still doing these dye projects probably until i get bored <laughs> <laughs> and um it's been it's been really fun but yeah I, it's definitely hard to keep up a practice i will yeah. say you don't have the space and the material is just at your fingertips right absolutely Yeah, I think um, speaking of like English, I, th I feel like I'm going back to the making process. But I just feel like that's the like that's the part of the work that's very important to you. And I think that's very interesting to me as well. So like, like you said, like, um, I think your the process, the making process is, has like a very poetic portion because of the 
engagement of the with the words, um, both text and the audio. And we saw that, so we saw that with the work, there's also a notebook that you kept, like, so you wrote down the text and then like stitched some parts of the textiles onto the notebook. So would, would you consider that as part of the work as well? And I'm just, I guess I'm just very interested in the notebook, the role of the notebook in the work. Yeah. Um, the, the notebook I actually started in the fall, last fall when I was first starting out with natural dyes and I was having to do a lot of experiments for the class um, that I was in and then sort of like learning how to dye things naturally and then um, trying to keep track of like what I did to get that color because I, I had no idea like what exactly I was doing. Um, and so I would just like staple a little piece in there and then write down how long it had been in there, if it was in there overnight, that sort of stuff. Um, and so I tried to continue that through quarantine and um, Professor Sen really loved the idea and wanted me to try to take some pictures, but it was it's kind of difficult to get it correctly. So I don't know, it's, it's more of the like personal part of the project for me, like sort of like a sketchbook before I finish painting or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of my classmates really loved being able to see my own handwriting with everything that was going on. And so um, it was one of those things where I was just trying to put every aspect of the project into the one folder. <laughs> kind of a document of the process as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love the idea of thinking of it as like an initial sketch before going into the actual finished product. Um, and I, I feel like there's a very like physical quality to having everything from the handwritten notes to the um, hand process of the dyeing and all of it. And it feels like it's it, there's a lot of kind of like physicality within the entire process. Um, do, do you think that that would have changed if you had done texts that were, um, if you had like done a, um, what's some, what am I trying to say? Like a technological type of notebook. Do you think that it kind of, it might, would have changed your relationship to the like whole process in any way? Um, probably, I probably would have been really frustrated with trying to communicate what was happening. Mm. Um, I felt that even in photographing the colors that it wasn't I wasn't sure that they looked quite right or how they would look on someone else's screen mm -hmm. yeah I think it's it's important that I was keeping a physical notebook and like it's something I'll be able to go back to and see this fabric and like feel it and see the notes and it's to me like the physicality feels much more representative of that time for me Mm -hmm. rather than, I don't know, another document that I can open yeah. on my computer, so. Absolutely. Speaking of that, um, I'm just wondering, cause like going through, we only saw your work like on, on our laptop. So like there's a distance that we can't, like we can't make it. And I'm just wondering, so like seeing the photos, I, I don't, I'm just wondering like if you can install it, if you can present it in person how would it be installed? Because the yeah, photos that's, there. This is a really good question. It was something I was thinking about a lot before we had to leave was like, how do I best install natural dye? And like, how do I show it to someone? And one of the things I was thinking about was like having them available on a table with like written like tags or something so that people could go through and actually touch them and pick them up and feel them and see them like very up close yeah. so I guess if in my ideal world that would be how it would be and maybe set up in like a you know in my like a dream world um like in some sort of kitchen type looking installation mm -hmm. but like everything is very white and basic and then it's just all of the color is really in the towels I guess oh that's wonderful 
Um, so I think that's all we have time for. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. We really yeah. appreciate it. And yeah, it was great to hear about the work. It was wonderful. Thank you guys for taking the time. I didn't know this was something that was happening. <laughs> <laughs>